I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 113 is Jungian analyst Leslie Stein in Sydney, Australia. Born and raised on the mean streets of the Bronx, his path was rather different from other analysts. He attended the State University of New York, where he earned a degree in sociology and psychology and played basketball, and then went on to law school in Toronto, later becoming a law professor and, for 10 years, served as a judge. In the 1980s, he trained as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute of New York and started a private practice, but left it behind to pursue his particular specialty of using legal mechanisms to improve mental health in urban areas. He completed a master's degree at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto and thereafter has been a professor at law schools and urban planning schools in Canada, the US, England, Australia, and India. Professor Stein has written five books on how to make our decaying cities livable. This has resulted in him being sought out as a consultant to the United Nations and governments around the world on managing urban blight, homelessness, the effects of climate change, and the inclusion of mental health in strategic planning. His work on strategic planning for neighborhoods was given an award by the United States Congress of New Urbanism, and he was, among other appointments, invited to be the visiting scholar at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University. He then became senior fellow for four years at the Global Center for Environmental Legal Studies in New York. He even now maintains that interest as an adjunct professor of urban planning law at the University of Sydney. It was on a trip to India for the UN on the urban planning of Varanasi that his interest in mysticism was awakened, and he then returned full-time to practice as an analyst, spending long months in India and enrolling at the C.G. Jung Institute in New York to refresh his work. Since then, he has written or edited four books on Jungian thought, reflecting that interest, including Working with Mystical Experiences in Psychoanalysis, The Self in Jungian Psychology, Becoming Whole, and the novel The Journey of Adam Kadmon. He is recently editor and contributor of Eastern Practices and Individuation, Essays by Jungian Analysts, released today by Chiron Publications. This spring, he attended the Aranos Conference in Switzerland, where he presented a paper on collective individuation in our troubled times, and was just appointed to the board of directors of the Philemon Foundation. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, August 31st, 2022, through the magic of StreamYard. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Stein. It's a pleasure for sure. I've always enjoyed your uh, your podcasts. And... Oh, thank you. It's lovely to have you and to see your beautiful library there in Sydney. It's just gorgeous. And it's winter there. You have the fireplace on, right? It's, uh, well, winter by Australian standards, about 50 degrees. About 50 degrees. So, uh, yeah, we're just finishing up summer and it's still really hot here in Chicago. So... We're uh, on opposite ends of the world, um, but hopefully on the same page today. So we have a lot to cover, and um, I would like to begin by uh, asking you about your personal journey in becoming a Jungian analyst. And really, this podcast, that was my original intention, and I'd really like to get back to that, is what one goes through to to get where where one is so you've had two different careers but they're connected in some way so tell us tell us your story uh, <clears throat> well i think um it all began when i saw this um uh, jungian analyst um in australia when i came here for the first time on sabbatical I was then at the uh, University of Toronto, 
and I came out to Australia. I was on just one year sabbatical and went to see this analyst, a woman called Rick Sweaver, who was one of Jung's original students in Zurich. And uh, through her, I really developed the interest and began the whole idea of training and uh, um, continued along. But when I finished, um, I just thought I wasn't really ready to, uh, to do this work. There was a, uh, a great uh, longing in me to do something for the community. So I became very much a kind of uh, radical lawyer, you could say, appearing for environmental groups even back then, mm -hmm. um, spending a lot of time trying to figure out um, how our cities could become livable. Coming from New York and growing up in the Bronx, I was really interested in the, the way that could affect mental health because I know it certainly did. Um, at that point, there was a book that came out called Jane Jacobs, Death and Life of Great American Cities, which talked about ways in which cities come alive in terms of interactions and mixed uses. <clears throat> so that fascinated me, and I did that, uh, continually um, acting in these matters. Um, and then what happened is I was asked to go uh, from the, from the UN, for the UN to uh, two places, to Varanasi in India, the holiest place in India, and also to um, uh, Bangkok, was the, then working on the master plan. Um, but when I arrived in, um, in India, uh, and this is uh, approaching now uh, almost 50 years ago, mm -hmm. when I arrived in uh, India, I, it was uh, about 120 degrees. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, and I um, everything was totally chaotic, and I walked down to the ghats, which are the steps leading down to the water in India. And then I saw these sadhus, these monks, sitting there in perfect stillness. Mm. And I began to see there was a dimension that I certainly wasn't getting uh, as a lawyer, a dimension of mystery is the only way I can put it, like pulsing humanity, of which not only did I feel a part, but it contained within it a kind of uh, mystery about the collective and, and what else was uh, what these men doing uh, sitting in this 120 degree heat in perfect stillness in the middle of dust and, uh, and uh, at that point apparent madness. And I was just gripped with the possibility that there was something uh, that I needed to pursue. So I continued that as the main, my main interest and every year thereafter uh, until, in fact, we actually got to the COVID years, I'd go to India for two months a year. Also, I went um, to uh, Bangkok. From Bangkok, I went to the various monasteries, Wat Pa Pong, Achin Cha's monastery, um, went a lot to Cambodia, also went in search of the, uh, of the Kabbalists, both in Israel and also in Brooklyn, where I had some fantastic time when I was there. Uh, so that's been my lifelong push. So the idea of being a Jungian analyst was highly consistent with what was my main interest. It wasn't for me a profession initially. Mm -hmm. It was just a desire to sort of expand or purify myself a bit mm -hmm. through my own, uh, to the extent that one can, through my own analysis um, mm -hmm. and through the studies. And then I discovered in Jung the same sort of longing um, the same kind of longing that's in him and Aurobindo and all these great teachers of looking for something which actually can sustain us in such difficult times. They've always been difficult times, and, um, and Jung, of course, wrote about those. And then I came upon this idea that he found the self, uh, this idea that there's something within us which is a centering function, which neurobiology has actually confirmed. In fact, with deference to Jung, they've, uh, they've found it. And the idea is that there's a, an aspect of ourselves which constantly is seeking something deeper and settling within us. And that actually has its own autonomy. And putting those things together, I thought, well, I'd go back into practice now and sort of uh, sit in that space with clients um, because that's the space where I want to live. Um, and that was a way to do it. And I certainly couldn't continue doing it as a as a lawyer and uh, mm. doing traveling around for different governments and doing advising and all the time advising on the same question. How do you make a place more livable? Um, how do you account for depression in urban areas? Now, especially I'm interested in homelessness. 
Um, um, I just gave a talk just yesterday to all the judges about uh, about this whole idea of how to make a place more human, mm. um, how to actually be uh, so people don't suffer so much as they're doing in uh, terrible places, San Diego, San Francisco, yeah. Portland, and, and so on with the homelessness. So that's my route. As you said, it's not a, it wasn't a direct one. It was somehow that mm. the uh, the whole becoming a union analyst fit what I already was or becoming. Mm. That's where I moved back to it to re-enter it like a door. Um, mm. And now I'm very happy I did because mm -hmm. it allows me the chance to meet with brilliant colleagues and people who have that interest. And also I seem to attract uh, people to my practice who have uh, Eastern practices, a Buddhist monk, uh, people who are very much involved in this whole question of the of the deeper meaning that we all seek. Mm -hmm. I don't want to uh, gloss over this. Would you just share with us a little bit about your talk, the talk that you gave yesterday about making cities more livable and and the and the problem of homelessness? Yes. Well, there's a um, uh, it's a place called the uh, Land and Environment Court, which is like an appeal body, and I was asked to give a talk about the role of the Land and Environment Court in the, in the whole state. And I talk very much about the fact that um, the real decisions um, that have to be made are not made by them, and therefore um, things have to change by way of reform. Um, th there are attempts everywhere in, in Chicago as well as uh, uh, here to try and sort of figure out a way to actually make these areas which are getting more dense and yeah. more intense uh, feel like it doesn't give you a sense of anime and getting lost. So very much I was talking about that yesterday um, at uh, this conference, uh, the 40 year anniversary of the uh, of this court. So I, I maintain that interest, Laura. I mean, it's really important to me to mm -hmm. see if I can practically do something yeah. because I feel that part of the individuation process carries with it a duty to actually do something for the community. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think you can just have a solipsistic sort of relationship with with the works of Jung. You also have to bring it back as best you can into the community. Yeah, and that is part of the individuation process, isn't it? It is indeed, because there's a reciprocity. I mean, we rely on the community for various things. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, as a Simon Din, the, uh, the French philosopher, talked about it. We have a a, a reciprocal relationship with the community. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, in a sense, a kind of uh, duty to sort of uh, improve ourselves as best we can <clears throat> for the sake of the, the, the whole corpus. of, um, And as well, we have a positive duty to actually, to the extent of our abilities, not some broad thing about necessarily going out there and saving the world, but to the extent of our abilities, mm -hmm. try to get something back in the group that's actually supporting our practice of individuation, which is in a way quite a solitary yes. um, way to proceed. Yes. And that reminds me of, uh, I was not at the Aranos conference, but I heard that you gave a talk on individuation to advance the well-being of the community, which is really what you're talking about now, and on collective individuation. Would you tell us what that is? Well, that's interesting. I don't have it in front of me now to show you, but uh, Jung actually at one point drew a mandala, which is, appears in the Red Book, mm -hmm. which actually shows that the, the self, the idea of that center point, the <clears throat> both the uh, numinous mystical center point we have within us, which actually is like a guide, was in great array, a beautiful star in the beginning, and around it were little neighborhoods. And there were roads leading from the neighborhoods into the star and mm -hmm. from the star down to the neighborhoods. Um, so very much the, the, the point is that the idea of the self, which, was, uh, which I wrote that book about, is very much the idea that there is actually something as ancient as time. The closest relationship probably in religious terms is in Advaita Vedanta, the idea that there's an Atman, that there's something within our heart. In that case, they call it a, a, a drop in the ocean of, uh, of God. Um, and that actually is constantly working for our refinement. 
And we need to, in some ways, make that available and make that known to the community that, that exists, not because we're pushing Jungian analysis or trying to make any claim for Jung, but rather because that does exist. And the, if someone finds a centering point, the Holy Ghost is the same point, uh, the fact that it's an uh, evolutionary force that's moving us, God's will, whatever you want to call it, um, if we make that available as a point of reference, then a lot of the suffering actually could be diminished. So I go into areas um, where people are uh, lost in these uh, high-rise buildings with no, as mm -hmm. you have there, with no actual sort of connection with their neighbors and so on. And these things are badly designed. There's no sense of sort of uh, the urban landscape that must take place, a diversity of housing and different age groups and so on. So uh, that's the idea of collective individuation, the idea that we must accept the fact that it's not just our individuation, but that there's a duty owed to the community because we rely upon the community for our, our life, um, for yeah. our water, our gas, our everything else. Mm -hmm. and, you mentioned the book that you wrote on the self. The title is The Self in Jungian Psychology, Theory and Clinical Practice. It was published last year by Chiron. And in that book, you say experiencing the self is the ultimate goal of life. Without the self, there is no Jungian psychology. So you probably already have, but is there one definition that you would give for the self? Yes, I, th I think the best way to, to look at it is what Eric Neumann, who was an early disciple of Jung, mm -hmm. um, called it the process of centroversion. The idea that um, everything is moving around and around at a center point. Um, and the importance of that center point is that should you identify that that exists, then all the noise that's in your head, all the ego movement that's in your head about what you should be doing and problems, you can all actually, uh, in that sense, relax with that and understand that the self is purposeful, the unconscious is purposeful, and it's actually leading you along the way. And if you do that, you attribute that to someone else. That's the first primary, or not someone else, but something else. That's the first primary basis of Jungian analysis to actually begin to accept the unconscious, to realize that it's working in your favor. And I'm blessed to be able to hear dreams all day. And those dreams actually to me sometimes, I, I can't even believe it. I get yeah. tears in my eyes, oh yeah. boy. Uh, because here's the something working through each person in a way which is so profound and powerful that there must be something at work for their benefit. Yeah, Pushing them along, saying, wake up, this is actually what's happening. And you need to, in fact, uh, <clears throat> begin to see that there's a purposeful force within you which is doing it. So that's what the self's about. Mm -hmm. It's a process of circumambulating the, the center of oneself and watching all these things happen, all of which are being drawing you into a, advancing you. Unfortunately, we can see that, that with the coronavirus. I mean, it keeps on mutating. Where's that coming from? It's, it's that evolutionary force that's looking for its refinement the same mm. way. Well, it's a terrible analogy, but also the way that we're actually looking to purify ourselves, perfect ourselves, refine ourselves. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my approach, and that's what I live. Mm -hmm. And another book that you wrote is titled Working with Mystical Experiences in Psychoanalysis, Opening to the Numinous. And that was the one that really got my attention. Uh, and for that book, you interviewed 29 mystics yeah. uh, in an effort to understand the variations of mystical experiences and how to work with them and their psychological meaning. And I think that that is something that I notice uh, in some of the other communities I'm involved in uh, gets kind of lost or or. Uh, maybe because it's so hard to get a handle on the psychological meaning of something. So what would you say about that you learned uh, from those 29 mystics? What did you come well, away with? Well, uh, the, the prelude to that 
is that and I'm able to speak about this because I have permission from the, uh, the client and also was able to write about it. A man uh, who's a lawyer comes to see me and says, uh, I've just been sitting in, uh, um, in a park, uh, Madison Square Park in New York, and I just went and got some uh, sushi and California roll, and I was sitting there, um, very conservative person, but all of a sudden the Virgin Mary appeared to me. Mm. Uh, it was uh, 12 foot high, and uh, there was light coming out of its womb. It wasn't actually as if it was a kind of uh, uh, vague, uh, porous uh, image. It was a crystal clear image. So at that point, I really had... Uh, honestly, I understood the expression beads of sweat because I, I was just overwhelmed by it. And I said, well, what do you make of it? And uh, he said, well, I was having a California roll and it must have been the crab stick. And it struck me really at that time that it's the whole thing about mystical experiences, your receptivity to them, how receptive you are when they come. Um, and he was not able to talk about it ever again. We dropped it and moved uh -huh. on to other things. So very much because I've been to India, as I mentioned, every year, year after year, and knew so many people, I went to find Western mystics, and also I went to Cambodia, the monastery there, to find Western mystics, people who are from Western backgrounds, who didn't grow up in that cultural milieu, who had uh, a, a sense of that that was their life now and they were living in uh, staying in india or they were going to um, uh, stay in cambodia in the monastery and all of them seemed to have what i thought was a common characteristic and i don't want to make this work too hard because uh, it's not conclusive uh, but nevertheless they all had an absent father uh, every single not every single one of them probably uh, almost all of them um, an absent father, um, and therefore there was a longing. It's like uh, D.T. Suzuki, the Zen master who brought Zen to America, said he spent his whole life looking for his father. He created a particular kind of longing. And then they had a mother often who actually drew them in as a confidant, but then didn't stay with that. And and then I thought, well, that actually fits Jung completely, who discounted his father and had a mother who was involved with seances and <clears throat> eventually had to be hospitalized. And then I realized um, one of my favorite writers is Aurobindo and Sri Aurobindo, and, and uh, he went to Pondicherry. And, um, and I realized, well, the same thing happened to him. His father sent him off to the UK and his mother went to the hospital for depression. Now, again, I don't want to make it work too hard. It's not a scientific study. Mm -hmm. But I found that um, all of these people who are pursuing this mystical thing had had a touch of that mystery somewhere in the early part of their life. They just had a touch of it and a longing that developed. Now, it's certainly the case I see. I, I meet people or have them as clients who don't have that same configuration. But it's the longing that it's all about, the longing that the, in order to be a... Uh, to sit in India and to live all over the place. And uh, um, especially I, I went to a place called Pushkar, uh, which is usually a tourist place where they have that camel fare. But there I met uh, a woman who is a German mystic, who, uh, who Kalima, who um, actually painted, uh, portrayed herself as the goddess Kali for a long time. And she was a highly advanced soul and uh, by anybody's standards. And, um, and she told me about other ones, and I, <clears throat> I, I met them one by one. It was fascinating time. It took several years to, to do that. And then I went, of course, to this Kumbha Mela um, in India in 2001, mm -hmm. where 50 million people were there, plus a kid from the Bronx. And, yeah, tell uh, us that story. I love that story. <clears throat> well, I, I was... Pulled, I mean, I heard it It was coming up, the Kumbha Mela, and I read about it. And uh, this one was said to be um, one that could be clocked. Uh, they're held every 12 years in this one place called Allahabad, which now called Priya Graj. Um, and this one was supposed to be the, the biggest one in 144 years. And I thought, well, I, I better go to this one. So I went along, and the, the conditions were, as you might imagine, horrendous. Um, 
um, and but to get down to the auspicious bathing day, uh, which was January twentieth, uh, um, two thousand and one, uh, I started that afternoon the day before, and it took me about um, the distance of about um, half a mile to go all the way through the night. Everybody was moving inch by inch across pontoons to slow down the uh, the people and. 30 million people are all trying to get there on the auspicious bathing time. And I managed to get there at that time and uh, literally had just the, uh, the clothes on my back and a money belt, which had my passport and some money in it. Um, and then I made my way into the water, which I had read the day before in a scrap of uh, Times of India newspaper, had lost mm. all oxygen, how that could be, how a river could it was all oxygen. It was the coming together of two rivers, the Ganges and the Yamuna River, one clean, one dirty, which made a, a, a line which was said to be the mystical Saraswati River. And it said if you bathed on that day, then uh, there's no more death and rebirth. Your cycle is finished. Uh, mind you, I don't want to give my rebirth up, but I did by going in there that time, if you took it literally. But I came out of the water dripping wet. It was so packed. Uh, there was absolutely nowhere to move. Um, I just was standing there and uh, wondering how I was going to get out and how I was going to get some fresh clothes. And a sadhu, a naked sadhu called the Naga sadhu, sky clad, they're called. And, okay. Uh, because they wear nothing. And, they, and I saw him making his way through. And I thought that's almost an impossible proposition. But everybody was getting out of the way of him. And there were many sadhus there and they wouldn't do that for them. But uh, and he was walking by and then he turned towards me and he grabbed my shoulders and he came within a few inches of my face. I was pretty scared at that point. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then he said in perfect English, he said, call off the search. Now, initially I thought, well, yeah, maybe it's because I'm a Westerner, you know, and uh, maybe that's the case, but no, it, it was something else he was saying to me. And, uh, and I thought for a second, well, what am I doing there really? You know, what am I looking for? Uh, what's possibly available to me? And um, how can I search for something I know nothing about? Um, so that began a long period for me of really trying to understand what call of the search could possibly mean. It's taken a lifetime to, to work for well, since that time to work that, work that through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have had, uh, I wouldn't say a lifelong interest, but um, most of my adult life, interest in uh, Eastern traditions. And uh, around the time that actually it was before I, yeah, it was well before I started analysis. And I don't know why I became interested in Hinduism and would go to Hindu temples in my town and became interested in Buddhism and would collect things. And then uh, in 2010, I met a group of Buddhist monks and traveled around with them for three years and they stayed in my home and I'm still in touch with them. And they're uh, Tibetans in exile in India, in South India. And uh, I you know, use WeChat and Facebook Messenger. And I, I'm not a practicing Buddhist. I'm so interested in them and what they do. And I've often wondered, what, what am I looking for? I mean, my life is so full. I'm so busy and fulfilled and I have so much to do and so much to read, yet I keep, I keep kind of poking at them and and wanting to ask them questions and read things and go to their lectures. And uh, I got my transcendental meditation uh, instruction in, in 1988. And it was like, I often wonder what am I searching for? W what is it that I don't have? What am I trying to fill? Well, I, I feel it's this, um, uh, the ego is not satisfied. And that's uh, the beginning and end of it. It needs more. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, the difficulty is that it wants to appropriate to itself everything that one does. So if one, in fact, um, meditates, uh, then they become a meditator. 
Um, they then follow a path, not knowing anything about the path, Eastern, an Eastern path, but nevertheless, they sign on because that longing is in them. And I think the longing is to uh, become what one can be, which is exactly how Jung put it. Um, and he gave it different names, as I mentioned before. He called it uh, um, God's will or um, uh, and, uh, religious instinct or the idea that there's something in us which wants more than we can see, which goes back to ancient times and continues. The only problem is that we try and obtain it much like... Uh, as one person must uh, called it spiritual materialism. You know, gather up these things that we've done, myself included. And <clears throat> you know, having read these books, having been to the Kumbh Mela, having to done all the, do all these things. But um, it's certainly the case that I've seen that people who have these practices uh, really begin to hang on to them. Now, a fascinating study appeared a couple of years ago where they interviewed. Um, people to see their attitude towards death. And they uh, interviewed Hindus and Christians, and they also interviewed Tibetan monks. And the people who were most afraid to die were Tibetan monks. And the reason was, uh, not that they had a definitive answer, but their conclusion was that because of the constant uh, feeling of sort of bliss that they get in their meditation, the constant enjoyment that they get of their rituals, um, that in fact the ego had taken hold of these things and therefore they didn't want to give it up. Who'd want to give up a life of constant bliss and, and, uh, and the like? So mm -hmm. uh, it's a fascinating thing how the ego works. Uh, but this is why I feel that one must actually discover um, uh, their attitude towards these things and find out what in fact if they want this, what in fact is necessary. And to me, there are two things that are necessary. One is the realization of that self, which is uh, the first mm -hmm. transformation. The second thing is really a kind of real purification of the ego, which doesn't amount to anything by fasting or a chanting or going to monasteries or whatever, but rather um, it always strikes me the last line of the book of Job, which is, uh, I'm comforted that I'm dust, mm. realizing where we sit in relation to the universe mm -hmm. and finding a kind of deep humility within us. And I think that's the only way, um, trusting that everything is going as it should, but also giving up the idea that we actually um, are anything but uh, if we even that a speck of sand. Well, you mentioned the ego. So let's talk about the the role of the ego in all of this. And in, in Jungian analysis, the work we do on that, and in Eastern practices. Well, I, I, think, I think Jung was right in the end, because he said for a Western mind, it's not possible to let go of the ego. Mm -hmm. So that um, he thought, no matter what actually happens, um, there's always a bit of the ego which is necessary. And if, in fact, we were able to, as he says in the East, in Satori or Samadhi, give up the ego for that moment, it's a dreamlike state. Mm -hmm. uh, Eastern practices don't look at it that way, as Lionel Corbett wrote about in this Eastern Practices book. Um, Eastern practices regard the fact that there is something else going on, the Atman, the self, uh, Buddha nature, the Holy Ghost, whatever it is, which actually is realizing itself. In a sense, it's acting and seeing itself through you. So there's a perfect harmony and quiet with no ego there. Uh, but the ego is necessary. And that's the fantastic thing about it, because you can't pursue any kind of spiritual path without the ego involvement. Um, the ego actually is necessary to help you understand what you have to do, to even listen to these podcasts of yours, to, to try and resolve things, to have uh, Jungian analysis. Uh, so I don't think as Western as we can give up the ego. I think that's an impossible situation. I agree totally humbly with Jung that we're not going to actually reach perfection. He called it in the end imperfect perfection. So, and so, he, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Tell us about what Jung said, and this is kind of well known, that uh, Westerners should avoid Eastern practices. Yeah. yeah, would you tell us a little bit more about that and, and where you stand on that? Yeah, well, I, I think that horse is bolted, as they say, a mm -hmm. long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, when he was writing that, the practices of the East um, were just being um, brought to attention of others. Um, Jung had uh, the great books of the East in his library where he got all this information from. He didn't get it from seeing anybody and discussing it with them. When he also went to India, he actually didn't go and see some of the great saints, uh, Ramana Maharshi. Um, he didn't go to see Aurobindo. In fact, I saw the letter in the, uh, uh, in the Aurobindo library in Pondicherry where uh, Jung had written said that he won't be attending because he's seen so many people already that you see one, you see them all basically. So um, I think, you know, at that point, people now look at it and, uh, you know, and think it's very confusing. Why didn't he go see these great people? And I think he was once, a, uh, firstly, a bit intimidated by India as everybody is who goes there. You have sure. to be intimidated by it. And uh, also he thought that if he went in that direction, it would really skew what he was trying to say. Um, so I think he said they, you know, it's not really for the West, but now it's so absorbed. Uh, mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, yoga, mm -hmm. um, meditation, um, all of that's now part of the, what I call the spiritual technology, which we actually have. It's not necessarily a spiritual path. It's a technology that arrives from the spiritual practices. Um, so when you, when you go sometimes to India, you go to a place like Varanasi and you, you see a, a man in his 90s uh, out there uh, doing uh, all these asanas and turning himself inside out, you think, oh, well, that's what it is. It's a kind of super refinement of the body. We might achieve some of that by yoga, um, but I, I think nobody accepts anymore that Jung really was correct that we should ignore that anymore. It's so absorbed in the in the West now, but it's absorbed only at the level of what Jung calls a psych, uh, not Jung, Aurobindo calls a psychic transformation. That is, we start getting the mind more inwardly turning, which is a very useful thing. When it comes to the spiritual transformation, which is supposed to be next, it involves you actually accepting the fact that there's an aspect of the, if you can call it the divine or the Buddha nature within you, and that's really operating and you're just watching that. Um, and I don't think that's relevant to uh, Jungian analysis um, as it's practiced in the West. There's too much ego involved, but it's not to discount it. I've seen when people actually have Eastern practices and that's the conclusion of the book, um, it's different from uh, Jungian analysis but they always actually seem to bring something to the table, which is a bit different than a person who doesn't have that exposure. So it's always a worthwhile thing. I always get enjoy when somebody comes to see me and they've had a, a lifetime or many years of Eastern practices. I always find that very refreshing because they're immediately open. Uh, they might not want to deteriorate or degrade their own practice and their own beliefs that they had to hang on to. But nevertheless, they are quite open to an inner reality, which they've already seen through meditation. So here in the United States, uh, meditation is, I would say, well known. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of meditation and yoga. And so those, in the general sense, are my impression is that they're done for stress reduction, uh, exercise, uh, yoga for weight loss, and that they're not necessarily spiritual practices. So, well, we, we have to ask the question, as you asked before, you know, what are we looking for? Mm -hmm. And the, the reality is that if somebody's doing Shivasana at the end of doing a yoga session, uh, lying like a dead body, like Shiva, and that's the pose, uh, then they're reflecting hopefully inside themselves. Um, they're beginning the practice, which is essential to Jungian analysis, of getting comfortable with the unknown within oneself. 
rather than saying, I'm not interested, I'm not going to. So in those sense, those practices, uh, even though they might be more commercial or uh, not in fact be the same as a proper Eastern practice, so mm -hmm. to speak, still fulfill an openness and it's a, they open a person up. I, I'm very much in favor of people doing them, but not as a, uh, a whole path or a mountain that they have to climb because they won't be able to climb it. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, because I'm thinking about my own, uh, my own experience of, um, I, when I first started doing yoga, I found out about Kundalini yoga because it was back when I was going to New Mexico every year and Yogi Bhajan brought Kundalini yoga to Española, New Mexico. And so there were a lot of Kundalini yoga practitioners and I did that. And then I had these uh, DVDs that I would do at home. And this was all while I was in analysis. And I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you think of the process of undergoing Jungian analysis and having a, an Eastern spiritual practice in addition to it. So how do they, how do they kind of live? How, how do you live with both? Yeah. I, I, I mean, my, my sense of it is that the Eastern practice um, will all have a framework which provides for something which is akin to what one is going to find in Jungian analysis. That is, they'll be able to find an inward director. They'll be able to find that the search is actually to do with uh, like uh, Advaita Vedanta, which is very much about the idea of there being sort of this watcher, which is uh, that aspect of the Atman, which is constantly watching things. So they'll bring all that in with them. And therefore, that'll help their, what I call their, as Aurobindo called it, their psychic transformation, mm -hmm. the ability to sort of attribute their lives to forces beyond their own ego. Mm -hmm. And so that um, uh, after they, as they work through a lot of the darkness within them, the shadow elements, as you know, as they opening phase, they begin to see that, in fact, there is a purposeful aspect to the unconscious, that it's really trying to help them. It's like its guide. And I think by having Eastern practices, that that adds to something for them. But it's only one level of, of what Aurobindo called, and which I really like the idea of a triple transformation. It's the mm -hmm. first one. It helps, it helps the Jungian analysis, helps them reach that stage. Um, but it all doesn't have to be like that. I'm just talking about people who are so inclined. There are a lot of people who have no interest in yoga or um, or meditation and mm -hmm. don't want to meditate or the like. But in answer to your question, I think they 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 come together quite nicely. Uh, neither one's required for the other. Yeah. But should they both appear at the same time, they do dovetail together. Even though the the uh, Eastern practices are ancient going back thousands of years, while Jungian analysis is basically uh, new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, uh, Jung was very much in uh, looking for that, uh, that place in oneself, which he said the numinous experience, which he said actually was the real therapy, remarkably. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's interesting, he also in the black books which Sono Shamdasani brought out, um, they often also talk for the first time about a little known uh, moment in 2017 where Jung wrote home to his wife and said, I've actually had a mystical experience. I've tried very hard to see that full letter, but I haven't seen it yet. But he, he acknowledges that he had that and he obviously had many other visions and the like along the way. So he was oriented that way. He just didn't, there was no framework for him. Um, the, the sacred books of the East that he used, in fact, were uh, interpreted by one particular person who had a, a specific point of view, which is different from the mainstream now. Um, so I feel that um, he opened the door, he saw it, he understood that the the uh, soul is actually um, wanting to manifest, something's wanting to manifest within us. And he found a way in which we can do it by first accepting the width and breadth of the unconscious through looking at our mm -hmm. shadow and then beginning to actually see that there's something in us which is purposeful and handing over a lot of your 
day-to-day -day issues to that part of yourself. And therefore, the craziness of the ego quiets down. And that's the test, really, is just one of peace. It's one of mm -hmm. peace. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And I heard you say that numinosity is the pivot point of civilization. Yes. I love that. Hmm. Well, I think without that, uh, there's no real uh, refinement. I mean, where do we see it now? I mean, it, you know, it'll merge again, I'm sure. I mean, as horrible as these times are. <clears throat> but those who have those experiences, and I don't know if more are having them or less are having them, yeah. um, begins to sort of open them up to sort of a, more of a, a kind of benevolence. It's not that the unconscious is benevolent. It's it's, it's bad and good at the same time. It's mm -hmm. evil and good at the same time. But nevertheless, it is corrective all the time. And if one actually moves more to that, um, then in fact, um, that work in the community is done back to our idea of collective individuation. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the new book. Uh, it's being released today. And I first heard about it when I had a uh, Jungian analyst, Royce Froelich, on it was episode 107 it was back in march and he told me that you were editing uh, a new book of essays by jungian analysts and you gathered together 10 authors uh, there are 10 essays in the book one is by you uh, and another is a dialogue between murray stein and jim man Mangian manganiello uh, we don't know how to pronounce his name uh, and you ask, what are Westerners looking for in Eastern practice, which is what we've been talking about today. And uh, would you tell us uh, what prompted you to put this book together? <clears throat> well, I think it was uh, the fact that when a Buddhist monk came to see me, um, that person um, who I, I haven't written about and won't talk about in any more detail, but that person, actually was kind of lost in the rigidity of their practice mm. a person of such great potential but nevertheless uh, would say things like well that's not the buddhist way and we don't mm. do it that way and so on uh, thereby forestalling what i consider to be a real potential in terms of psychological growth mm. which would have resolved a lot of the personal problems he was having <clears throat> And of course, my whole lifelong interest in, in that as well, I was interested in some definitive idea, trying to really come to grips in these modern times where everybody's involved with yoga and these right. technologies. What's the relationship between the two? So I pick people on purpose um, because I know, for instance, Polly Young Eisendraff has written very much about her own personal experience. Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought <clears throat> it would be fascinating to hear what she has to say about it. Um, I, I knew that um, others have had these experiences as well, <clears throat> such as um, Ashok Betty, who's Indian. Yeah, Dr. Betty. Very, mm -hmm. very much about the Upanishads, which Jung actually used as a basis for his conclusions. <clears throat> uh, Pat Katsky, who's um, in Pacifica, who also has written a fantastic article about Advaita Vedanta recently in Jungian analysis, um, did a kind of experiment with all her, her patients and to see how that actually affected their lives. Mm. Um, and there were others. Uh, and I ended the whole thing with Royce, actually, because there's nobody I know who's a Jungian analyst who's more in touch with the modern movements of the society and technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. How could we possibly be um, you know in that quiet place with all the technology that we have around us um so that's how i got started on it and uh over the last year and a half people have been constructing these essays there's also an incredible one by karen girene who's um speaking i think this week in the jungian mystery school about her lifelong practice as a jungian analyst she lives in amsterdam um so these people luckily trusted me enough and came forward and we put together the book with a, my own chapter and an introduction. And it really tries to answer where we are now in this, uh, everybody's involved with these practices in some form or another. How does that relate to the practice of Jungian analysis? Mm -hmm. So you're right, this came out today. I got my, I got my copy 
here today as well. There it is. And we're going to be giving away a copy this week on Twitter. Uh, our book giveaways usually start on Wednesdays. Uh, this week, our book giveaway will start on Thursday. Uh, follow me at Jungian Laura and Chiron Publications at Chiron BKS. And simply, uh, you need to follow us and retweet for entry. And the winner will, will be chosen Friday evening. Uh, and... The full title of the book is Eastern Practices and Individuation, Essays by Jungian Analysts. And your chapter, um, Professor Stein, your chapter is called uh, Archetypal Forces and the Ego Structure of Eastern Practices. And you also wrote the uh, introduction. So, is there, let me see if there was anything else I wanted to ask you about the book. Um, yes, you brought up the shadow and that I would like to have you expand on a little bit because that's something that in my, just as a kind of on a personal level, my experiences with the Tibetan Buddhist monks who are here in the US, I met them because they were on tour with the mystical arts of Tibet, um, which is to raise awareness about Tibet and their culture. And they create these beautiful sand mandalas and they usually take four days and then they sweep them up and disperse the sand into a body of water and then distribute it to the attendees um, to kind of symbolize impermanence. Um, but when I'm hanging out with them and having lunch with them, and as I said, they have stayed with me in my home, I'm kind, I find myself trying to be on my best behavior because um, you know I want to be positive and smiling and happy all the time, and that's not me. That is not my personality. And so I wonder, you know, it, they they actually wear these t-shirts and they sell and give away these t-shirts that say uh, happiness is my religion and i where does the shadow come into all of that well it's pretty clear that happiness is the end product it's not the uh, it's not the uh, way to go along the way the uh, the idea behind the uh, as i understand it behind the uh, work that we do in relation to the shadow and the fact that we have all these shadow qualities must be understood on the basis that the unconscious is 50% good, but 50% bad. That is, it's capable of all sorts of things, of illnesses, of falls, of uh, all sorts of problems and, and neuroses and or something different. But <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, all of these things can come up in a way in dreams and otherwise which then requires a kind of uh, spiritual bravery, I like to think about it, to be able to engage with those things and accept things. I mean, I uh, once had a sort of very sneaky character in my, uh, in my analysis in a dream, and uh, the analyst, she said to me, oh, well, that's a part of you. I go, oh, no, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm straightforward. It couldn't possibly be. But the recognition, the beginning to open up the unconscious, to understand it's all these things, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's infinite in size. But nevertheless, whatever it is, it's moving for your benefit. So it actually establishes a working relationship with the, you begin to see these shadow elements, you work through them. You can't get rid of these shadow elements. Mm -hmm. uh, all you can do is accept their existence and the fact that they're in you, which broaders your personality and broadens you out. So when you find yourself um, jumping at something and moving too fast, you begin to recognize that that's a repeated pattern and therefore the level of resilience increases so that there are things which actually you you sort of move back from quickly, even though they'd be un, unpleasant. But again, the idea of, you know, we're trying to act out of our ego when we see the monks, I do the same thing and, you know, polite, right. and, because we're bowing really to a tradition. We're bowing mm -hmm. to a tradition which carries these stories about enlightenment and higher states, and we all crave them. We all do. There's no one who doesn't really sure. in, in any way. And then often people take drugs to find a way to reach them and, yeah. um, and move in different directions. Uh, but the, the shadow work in the context of an analysis where it's contained and understood and guided through uh, use of active imagination, if appropriate, or of symbolization, 
um, all of that begins to just open up that whole space in us and make us see that there's more at play than just our mind, which is moving around and telling us to do this and do that. Um, so it's a, a very strong um, aspect. How it relates to uh, Eastern practices is interesting because I uh, interesting because I found that people who do that work, that shadow work, actually find that their meditation really deepens mm. because they're not so many noises in their head, mm. and parts of them are necessarily under different management, and they begin to see that they're more integrated. And in fact, Jung and Aeon uh, drew this diagram, which actually showed the movement of uh, primal person through the shadow work into a sense of wholeness uh what he called equivalent to the albedo stage in alchemy a sort of peacefulness um so that's that's the progress because one actually sort of sees themselves in the in the wider brighter light that they that's been revealed mm -hmm. well as we wrap up here today uh i i heard you tell a story about and I, I don't have the name, um, but um, someone you met in India who um, was had committed murder, and he told you something. And when I heard you tell that story, I had such a strong reaction to it because I get it, and but I can't talk about it, and uh -huh. I don't dare talk about it because every time I try to, I am shut down. So to hear you tell that story was so validating and comforting. And I don't even know if that's the right word. Probably not. I don't know, maybe. And would you tell it here? If, if not? I'm happy to. Sure. I'm happy oh, great. to. Great. Um, I'm very interested in what you meant by that, but I'll just tell the story. Okay. Um, so I'm in a, a, a place where I, often go and meet people in Pushkar, which is in Rajasthan, which okay. is um, not far from Ajmer. And, um, and I'm walking along way out into the countryside by myself. And uh, somebody who I vaguely know, a villager, comes up to me and says in Hindi, you've got to talk to that man who's sitting right there in the burial, the burning ground, the cremation ground. And I looked over and it was a man who was in ragged, um, orange robes and uh, totally disheveled. And I said, why would I go there? They said, well, you've got to go go see this person. He's just got out of jail. He was in jail for 41 years and he murdered two people and he just got out now and he's become a monk. Oh, well, why am I going to go see him? So I, I went over and in my broken Hindi, which seems to sort of fade out every year only to come back when I go to India. Mm. I said to him the usual greeting, Namaskar Baba, and I asked him, is everything good? And he uh, looked at me for what seemed to be five minutes. Uh, I didn't know what to do. Was I to get up and move or walk away or was it you know, whatever? He had one tooth in his mouth only. I saw he was, <clears throat> and then he spoke to me, he said, there's no good, there's no bad. And I thought, well, Wherever he is, is that place of non-duality, that place of complete reconciliation of the conflicting opposites, the magical place, which is Jung called the unis mundus, the primordial ground of being. Um, and there he was, uh, having been a murderer and having uh, been so filthy and, and disheveled and full of dirt and God knows what else. But... Uh, um, there he was. He already got there. I had nothing to say. I was as stunned as you were. I just stood there and he walked away and lay back on the ground. But uh, uh, that made me understand that there is that possibility. But I, it's not available to me and I don't think it's available to any sort of Westerner. Nor do I intend to commit those double murders to find out. Right. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Hmm. And thank you for your time today. Pleasure. Uh, I, I usually ask my guests at the end if there's anything uh, that we haven't discussed that, that you would like to bring up. Uh, no, I think, uh, I think my essential um, uh, statement, if, uh, if I'm called upon to make one, is the fact that, like he said, everything is fine. 
everything as it should be. And the more that we accept that, the less suffering uh, we'll have. That would be my only statement, uh, a statement that I, I try to live by as much as possible, but also mm -hmm. um, is the real end product, I believe, of Jungian analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, people become at peace and a deep peace where they feel a connection uh, with their environment and the world, but stop suffering, give yep. up the suffering, call give it off. The suffering. Call it off. I like that. Thank you, Professor Stein. Thank Please you. visit the website, speakingofyoung.com for more information on everything discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. And immediately after this episode, I will be live on YouTube for a post-game recap. So with special thanks to Leslie Toronto and Robert Domit at the C.G. Young Society of Sydney, and to Dr. Stephen Buser and Jennifer Fitzgerald at Chiron Publications, I'm Laura London, and you've been watching a special video edition of Speaking of Young.